Who are you? I'm your problem. Who? You? That's him. That's the beast. Call me Rosie Gold. Call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Well, Rosie Gold. Ho, holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Call me Rosie Gold. Call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Raw. Rosie Gold. Raw. Ho, holy Ho. I would never let you see in my holy soul They used to call me blessed Cause I got holy flows The bras think I'm God When I dress up in these holy clothes I got angels in my life At every angle in my life Instead of hating on me Blame it on the Christ I'm just tryna fuck these Like Adam and chill It get black smoke, black hat In a black coat I'm, I'm the, the first black pope on Vatican Hill I heal. I got that rosy gold I got that holy script if you know your role, hold it, ho, take this dick If you sold your soul, holy ho, make me rich They call me holy ho, cause I can make a bitch I put your soul to sleep just for speaking out your asses My crew is so elite though, we are not the masses I got mass on Sunday, ass on Monday Automatic beat, beat, that's that gunplay My dog gotta eat, and I know I gotta meet my god one day You are looking at your god Call me Rosy Gold, call me Holy Ho. I would never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosy Gold, look what I did. Go in. I would never let you see. I think it's working. Call me Rosy Gold, call me Holy Ho. I would never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosy Gold, ho, Holy Ho. I would never let you see Keep him. going in. I have indeed became a wean child of whom my mother spoke. If I die, I shall spring out of another yoke that's at the shot. Spring out. On another note, I leave blocks fiend out. On another dope, are you not entertained? Not, not entertained by the juice that I rock and the rocks in my chain. Go by in. the shoes that I rock and the rocks in my ring. Go Do in. you wear the same clothes? Are you not interchanged? If you fuck the same hoes, you are not in my lane. I do not cop blocks on these little knock knocks. I just pop shots at they little drop tops That's two to the head I'll shoot you in your head I'll make them niggas go to sleep with suits in they bed Y'all niggas not jiggy, yo, those niggas not hot These niggas not biggie, yo, who told them they was pop? Keep going Call me Rosie Gold, call me Holy Ho I would never let you see in my holy soul Look, Rosie Gold, Holy Ho I will never let you see in my holy soul. Call me Rosie Go, call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosie Go, Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. That's it. I think it's working. That's it. Fade away. Peace, power, and love. It's your one and only Kansu, Sheshmo Amun, with Team Osiris on another snowy December weekend, man. You know, we get the snow this time of year every year. And we have a special show today, man. We're going to be talking about the mind and meditation, concentration, getting to know the inner self. So really important and vital things, man, things that are vital to our connection to our surroundings and the universe, man. Some really, really um, beneficial things in meditation. And we have a special guest with Team Osiris, as we have our usual Team Osiris panel. T. Osiris member Hero Jones is going to elaborate on meditation. It is vital that we do that. So important. So, I, and I'm not going to waste much time. Brother Hero Jones, are you there, bro? Yes, I'm here, brother. All right, brother, um, the floor you. is yours. I digress. Yes, uh, I appreciate that, brother. Thank you very much for facilitating this, um, this presentation. And um, first of all, I would like to say peace and love to um, everyone that is viewing this um, presentation right now. And I would also like to say peace and love to the whole Team Osiris family. 
I would like to send a special shout out to um, the brother um, Amir Kamara and Gozi and the self-aware movement. Self-aware movement is um, another um, movement that the brother Amir has started and this is basically a self-aware aware movement presentation. Um, also, um, I would like to give an honorable mention to um, the venerable Dr. Banti Punanji, whom um, is someone that I have learned a great deal about Buddhism and meditation from. And so with that being said, this presentation on meditation, the Buddhist way and the scientific observation. Now, let me start by saying I am no guru. I am no master. What I am is someone that has learned meditation from some so-called gurus and masters and have studied and practiced meditation for many, many years. And so my goal here in this presentation is to share with you what I've learned in my meditation experience. So in this presentation, we will be discussing meditation according to the teachings of the Buddha, as well as what are some of the effects science has, ob has, has observed related to the practice of Buddhist meditation. Now, in this part on meditation or bhavana, as the Buddha called it, which means cultivation, we will be looking at three specific points. And those are, what is meditation? What is the aim of meditation? And as I have pointed out, bhavana means cultivation. And so what specifically are we cultivating in our meditation practice? Now, in the second half of this- Brother Hero, do you yes. need to start the slide yet? Um, not yet, in, in the second okay. half, I'll cue you in. All right. Okay, All right. so in the second half of the presentation, we will be taking a look at what are some observed effects of meditation on the brain? And what are the health factors connected to meditation? And finally, at the end of this half of the lecture on meditation, we will discuss how to meditate. All right, Brother Consul, you can um, cue the slides. All right, brother. Okay, now, first of all, why should anyone be interested in Buddhism and the practice of meditation? And specifically, those of us that are the descendants of Africans of the diaspora. Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> As I'm sure, we are all too well acquainted with chronic stress and constant physical tension and the mental distress that the challenges and experiences of everyday life can dump on us. And this constant experience of this chronic stress only serves to rob us of our natural peace of mind and threatens even our very health and well-being. It will, if allowed to continue, put us at a greater risk of disease as a perpetual state of unhealthy stress and mental worry actually depletes our immune system. Also, for those of us that are the descendants of African slaves, we can imagine the trauma that such an experience had on the physical and psychological nature of our beloved ancestors. And that physical stress and that psychological distress had undoubtedly negatively altered the conditions of our ancestors' 
physical and mental health. And to make matters worse, this physical stress and psychological distress has been passed down transgenerationally through epigenetic processes. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the ongoing struggle with systematic racism, white supremacy, that we as a non-European ethnicity have to deal with on a regular basis. And so Buddhism and meditation are more than just a philosophy, more than a humanistic religion. Buddhism and meditation are a psychotherapy. So these I answer are the reasons why we all should be interested in meditation. Now, meditation, what is it? Well, according to the original teachings of the Buddha, meditation is the cultivation of qualities that leads to purification of the mind or what is called samadhi insight into the nature of reality, or what is panya, transformation of behavior, or sila, all culminating in awakening from delusion and ultimately freedom or removal from suffering, which the Buddha called dukkha. Now, aren't all meditation methods the same? No. Not all meditation methods are the same. Thus, my reason for distinctly targeting Buddhist meditation. Now, when learning any kind of meditation, it is important to know what form of meditation you are learning and what is the goal orientation of that method. I mean, different methods of meditation may produce different effects depending on the goal orientation of their method. And so some important factors to consider when it comes to the various forms of meditation are who is teaching the meditation method? I mean, there are individuals that apply their personal interpretations to the teachings of the Buddha and make modifications to the method taught by the Buddha. Some individuals even just make up their own method altogether. For example, and I won't mention any names, but a well-known modern day school of comedic thought has a method of meditation that combines various techniques from different schools, such as Buddhist, Hindu, African spirituality, hypnosis, and even Pavlonian stimulus response conditioning techniques. So it can be useful to learn a little about the individual that is teaching the meditation method. You know, what are their qualifications? What is their experience? Also, what is the source of the meditation method. There's Christian meditation, Sufi meditation, Jewish mysticism meditation, Vedic meditation, New Age meditation, Western occult meditation. <laughs> so knowing the source of the meditation method is important for knowing what you are getting into. I mean, even in Buddhism, in the Buddhist tradition itself, there are various methods of meditation. At one point in the history of Buddhism, during the rule of the Indian, the Indian emperor Ashoka, nearly 300 years after the death of the Buddha, there were by some points up to 18 different schools of Buddhism with 18 different interpretations of the Buddha's teaching, teaching 18 different methods of meditation. 
Wow. Now, some methods of meditation were adapted to geographical locations. For instance, the Burma method differs from the Thai method, which differs from the Sri Lanka method. Even though they're all of the Theravada tradition. Now, some variations of meditation are adapted to culture. And some variations of meditation come from the commentaries on Buddhism. Now, one of the more famous commentaries are those of Buddha Gosa. Now, Buddha Gosa wrote a book describing Buddhism and meditation called the Vasudhi Maga or the path of purification, which is the basis for the method of meditation being practiced by many today. However, when you compare the Visuddhi Maga to the teachings of the Buddha, you will see that his method of meditation actually departs from what the Buddha taught. So knowing the source of the meditation method is very important when it comes to understanding its practice. So the source of the method that we will be discussing in this presentation is the Arya Maga Bhavana, which is popularly known as the Noble Eightfold Way. And so, what is the aim of meditation? Well, the aim of meditation was well stated in the definition that was given for meditation at the beginning, which is purification of mind and the acquiring of wisdom that leads to awakening and frees one from suffering. Now, before the Buddha, became the Buddha, which means the awakened one. He was Siddhartha Gautama, a prince of the Shakya tribe, a class of warriors that controlled a region of Northern India and Nepal, which is where Siddhartha was born. And as the story goes, and I'll make this short, before Siddhartha's birth, a yogi predicted to Siddhartha's father that Siddhartha would either be a great ruler of the world or a great spiritual master. Now, Siddhartha's father did not want his son to be a spiritual master, but instead a great ruler of the world. So to ensure that his son became a great ruler and not a spiritual guru, Siddhartha's father shielded Siddhartha from the world by keeping him secluded in their palace, surrounded by all the finest things that being a prince would allow. Now, however, one day Siddhartha decided that he would go for a trip outside the palace. And you know, he's the prince, so who's going to stop him? And in doing so, he ended up encountering for the first time in his life, an old person, a sick person, a dead person, and finally, a spiritual guru. Now, upon these encounters, Siddhartha realized the reality of existence and suffering, that all that are born must grow old, will get sick, and will eventually die. And upon this realization, Siddhartha determined that he would take up the spiritual path and discover the solutions to the problems of existence and suffering. So purification of mind, why purification of mind? Well, what it means to be but what it means to have a purified mind is to make it free of emotional disturbances and reactions. 
and to make the mind calm and still. Now, according to the Buddha, the mind is a combination of three activities of the body or brain. Now, these three activities of the body that make up the mind are one, our perception or vinyana, which involves becoming aware or conscious of what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Two, our cognitive processes, or what is called the mano, which includes the critical faculty thinking and involves giving meaning and interpretation to our perceptions. And three, are affective or emotional processes, or what is called chitta, which can be thought of as the temperament or mood and includes our memory and imagination. Now, according to the teachings of the Buddha, we become aware of the world by way of vinyana or our perceptions, which then goes to the mano, where it is interpreted and given meaning. And now depending on the meaning the mano gives our perceptions, our emotional mind or the chitta is aroused and emotional excitement is experienced. So we begin to relate to the world in a way that causes emotional arousal. In a sense, we develop a love-hate relationship with what we perceive. <laughs> when we perceive the world in a way that is pleasurable, we love it and we desire more of that pleasure. And when we experience the world in a way that is unpleasant, then we feel a hatred or aversion for that. Now, this grasping for pleasant sensations and running away from unpleasant sensations makes us unhappy and we suffer because we cannot get what we desire. And when we do get what we desire, we can't hold on to it due to the infinite nature of all things. Also, we become unhappy and suffer because we cannot always get rid of unpleasant experiences. And when we know an unpleasant experience is coming and can't be avoided, we also then become unhappy. See, when our minds are disturbed by emotional arousal, we are unable to think clearly and our body reacts and becomes full of tension and we begin to act and behave according to the emotional disturbances in ways that create suffering and unhappiness for ourselves and for others. And so according to the Buddha, if we are to be and end our unnecessary suffering, <laughs> we must learn to relax the body, purify the mind, and make it tranquil. And the way we do this is through cultivation. Now, let me be clear that I am not talking about suppressing or repressing the emotions. For example, let's say, you're in a public, public place and, and you see someone whom you've never met before, right? And so you feel a sexual attraction towards them, you know? Now, unless you're a sociopath or some sexual deviant, you will not act on those sexual desires. You know, your body may be telling you yes, <laughs> but your reasoning and your rationale tells you no, it is inappropriate. So you repress those sexual desires. 
So no, instead what I am speaking of is returning to the natural state of mental equilibrium. Now to borrow an analogy from one of my meditation teachers, the venerable Dr. Bhante Punaji, he said that it is like a baby, you know, when the baby is happy, his body is not tense and his mind is not disturbed. But when the baby is crying, then his body is tense and the mind is disturbed. And so what the caretaker does is attempt to return the baby back to its natural state of happiness. And so the first example that I just gave is a clear case of cognitive dissonance or what is called Vichy Kicha which is a disturbance of the mind and body and one of the five hindrances. No, what we are after is cognitive consonance, which is achieved by bringing the warring parts, which would be the chitta and the mano into union by equilibrium or tranquility of mind, which is samadhi. Now, Meditation is bhavana, which is cultivation, right? As mentioned before, what we usually refer to as meditation is translated from the Pali word bhavana, which would better translate it as cultivation, as the word meditation is too vague, ambiguous, and generic, and does not fully capture the essence of what is taking place in cultivation. And it also gives a limited description. That is, not all cultivation involves contemplation as the word meditation would suggest. For example, Samatha Bhavana, which is the cultivation of relaxation of body and calmness of mind leading to stillness of mind or samadhi. And so does not make use of contemplation at this stage of cultivation. So what it is we are cultivating, what is it that we are cultivating in our meditation practice is what is called Ariya Maga or the sublime eightfold way. Now, the Buddha and his teachings emphasize that in order to awaken and be free of suffering, it is necessary for the human to overcome three major defilements, loba, dosa, and moha. Now, Loba is the desire for pleasure. It's lust, the greed for pleasurable sensations. And dosa is the hatred or aversion or the desire to get rid of pain. And moha is the delusion of believing that I am the self or an eternal soul. <laughs> Now, to accomplish this goal, the Buddha taught there are three essential steps or three levels of training that one must progress through. Now, the first level is called sila. The second level is samadhi. And the third and final level is panya. Now, these three steps or levels constitute the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path consists of eight aspects to be cultivated. And these eight aspects are one, Samadhiti, or the harmonious perspective, normally translated as right view. Two, Samasankapa, or 
harmonious orientation, which is normally translated as right intention or right aspiration. Three, sama, which is the harmonious speech or normally translated as right speech. Four, samakamata, or what is the harmonious normally translated as right action. Five, sama ajiva, which is harmonious lifestyle, normally translated as right livelihood. Six, which is sama vayama, or the harmonious exercise, normally translated as right effort. Seven, samasati, or harmonious attention, which is normally translated as right mindfulness, keyword. And eight, the last and final step of the Noble Eightfold Path is Saba Samadhi, or harmonious equilibrium, which is normally translated as right concentration. Now, the first of the three steps to eliminating the major defilements is sila. Sila consists of cultivating the first five aspects of the Noble Eightfold Way and deals with morality and transforming the behavior. Now, the first aspect of the Sublime Eightfold Way is the harmonious perspective. The harmonious perspective or right view as it is commonly translated is more than just a view. It is the way one looks at life. And so after the Buddha became awakened, he gave a sermon and the first sermon the Buddha gave is what is called the Dhammachaka Pavatana. And in this sermon, the Buddha taught what is called the middle way, which is another name for the sublime eightfold way. And he began by pointing out there are two extremes that are to be avoided. The first extreme, extreme that is to be avoided, I mean to be avoided, yeah, avoid, excuse me, is indulging the emotions, you know, allowing yourself to simply just go after whatever it is you're lusting for. That's to be avoided, said the Buddha. And the second extreme to be avoided is suppressing the emotions. You know, when the Buddha, before he became awakened, the Buddha was an aesthetic. And the aesthetics are famously known for, you know, really punishing themselves, you know, going to extreme measures of starving themselves, um, hurting themselves. And, and the Buddha nearly almost died. And so when he became awakened, he understood that this extreme would be avoided. Now, the Buddha pointed out that one should instead follow the middle way. And he then went on to explain what is called the Four Noble Truths or the sublime fourfold nature of reality, which are suffering, the suffering of life, or dukkha, the cause of this suffering or samudaya, the end of this suffering or niroda, and the way to end this suffering, or maga. Now, as mentioned before, purification of the mind is needed in order to free ourselves of suffering. Also, not only must we purify our minds to free ourselves from suffering, but we must also attain full comprehension into the reality of suffering its cause, its end, and the way to end it. Now, this wisdom 
also gives us insight into the threefold mark of existence, which the Buddha called Anicca, which is the impermanence or instability or the unreliability of life. Dukkha, which is suffering or unsatisfactoriness or the insecurity of life. And Nata, which is the impersonal nature of life or selflessness or the non-existence of a permanent self or unchanging soul. Now this awakening to full comprehension or wisdom, which is Panya, and the liberation, Vimuti, from Dukkha, which is suffering, is the result of the Paticca Samuppada. You know, I've, I've read many books on meditation, right? And I've never seen anyone explain how the Buddha became the Buddha, right? And so Paticca Samuppada is actually the way the Buddha became awakened. Now that's a whole nother story. So once the harmonious perspective is realized, a natural outflow of that harmonious perspective is the intent to change the direction of how you live. Now this changing of how you live is what is called the harmonious orientation. You know, you make a complete 180 degree turn as you aspire to live the harmonious perspective. So right perspective and harmonious orientation are mainly a part of sila. They do naturally stem from panya or wisdom. Now, in making that 180-degree turn, the athlete recognizes the importance of using harmonious, taking harmonious actions, and living the harmonious lifestyle altogether. In fact, the five precepts, that is the vows every Buddhist takes after taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha are actually based on fulfilling Sila. So as we can see, Sila focuses on transforming the behavior through developing morality. But this is not a heteronomous morality meaning it is not the attempt to be moral because some outside authority gives you rules and tells you to. <laughs> Rather, it is the natural development of morality due to wisdom and realization of the harmonious perspective. It is autonomous morality. Now, these last three steps of the sublime eightfold way, samavayama, samasati, and samasamadhi are about meditation. Now, when people are referring to meditation, what they are usually referring to are the six, seven, and eight steps of the noble eightfold path. Now, let me point out here that the teachings on meditation don't even begin until we reach the six steps on up. And yet most people, when they speak on meditation, skip right over steps one through five on a sublime eightfold way and start right at the sixth step. Now, this is like a student in school skipping kindergarten through college and going directly to graduate school. <laughs> now, when the sixth, seventh, and eighth steps are isolated like that, there is no guarantee that meditation is being practiced correctly at that point. Now, the sixth step 
Samavayama gives necessary guiding protocols for a successful meditation practice. Now, these guiding factors or protocols are for another, and they set the foundation for proper meditation. And they are one, sambara, or prevention. Two, pahana, or abandonment. Three, bhavana, which we know is cultivation. And four, anurakana, or what is maintenance. Now, samvara, which is prevention, or what is called guarding the senses, means to keep the senses from creating new defilements, which can happen when the senses perceive inharmonious or unwholesome stimulus. And it does this prevention by taking your attention from the objects of perception. Now, this is why you are told to find a quiet place and close your eyes and why monks go off into some secluded area. Stories of monks going into caves or high mountains to meditate may come to mind. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to guard the senses when you are in a quiet place, you know, without many, if any distractions. So next is abandonment, abandonment or pahana, which means to keep the mind free of those memories and imagined perceptions that arouse already accumulated defilements. And this is also accomplished by removing the attention from the subjective perceptions. Now, at the beginner's level and even intermediate level of meditation, sometimes, more so at the beginner's level, when thoughts or emotions arise, the tendency is to get involved and be carried away by them. And, you know, but instead of getting involved and being carried away into a state of semi unconsciousness, the practice is to simply remove the attention from the disturbance. Now, when you remove your attention from the disturbances, where is it that you are to place your attention? Now, the answer to that question takes us into the last two guidelines of the four which collectively are known as the four harmonious steps. Now, bhavana, or the third harmonious step, at this stage of development means to cultivate the harmonious states. The harmonious states are those states that purify the mind and bring wisdom and peace instead of conflict. And finally, we come to the last guiding step of the harmonious exercise, anurakana, or what is called maintenance. Now, maintenance is to perpetuate the harmonious states that are cultivated in bhavana. And so really the six seventh and eighth steps, which are the Samadhi and Panya levels of the Noble Eightfold Path, can only be properly prepared for when one renounces the secular way of life. However, the practice of the Sila level, Samadhi level, and the Panya level of the Noble Eightfold Way can all be practiced by you know, the average layperson and the monastic. Now, this is not to say that the layperson can't achieve the higher levels of meditation practice. However, it is unlikely and probable unless that person basically lives like a monk and can dedicate themselves to the necessary rigor 
of practice. Now, Billy Tan, a student of Venerable Dr. Punaji and a highly sought after teacher and scholar of Buddhism, once said to me in a conversation we had that anyone can practice the full eight steps, but only by fully renouncing lay life is one adequately prepared to perfect the practice of the last three. <laughs> now, in order to be successful, in order to successfully practice sila from the first step through to the fifth and onward to the successful practice of samadhi and panya, it is necessary to develop conscious abiding. Now, conscious abiding is to be present and, and alert and calmly attentive. Now, at the sixth step of the Sublime Eightfold Way, an increased focus to develop this conscious presence is the aim. And this practice is called Samasati or Satipatthana. Now, the practice of meditation or bhavana happens in two stages. The first stage is what is called samatha bhavana, which because of its leading to what is ikagata or ikagata or one-pointedness is commonly referred to as concentration meditation. However, samatha is not concentration. It is the practice of relaxing the body and progressively calming the chitta, which is the emotional mind, until it becomes still, reaching what is called samadhi or purification of mind. All samatha bhavana is not a kind of meditation, rather it is a phase or stage in the meditation process. And now the second phase or stage of the meditation, meditation process is called vipassana. It's probably called vipassana or insight meditation. Now vipassana meditation is the observing of what are called the sankaras or the constructs of the mano which is the cognitive mind, thus cultivating wisdom. And so the flow from Samatha Bhavana through Vipassana Bhavana takes place through the practice of Satipatthana. Now Satipatthana is the word oftenly translated as mindfulness, that was that, that popular word, but as the venerable Bhante Punaji, a monk and Buddhist scholar of the Theravada tradition, points out, mindfulness is not a good translation. Now, according to Bhante Punaji, the Pali word Satipatthana is a compound word, Sati, Upa, and Thana. Now, Sati is a word that means attention. And it describes to remember or to recollect. And upa is a word that means inward or within. And thana is a word that means to place, as in place the cup on the table, for example. So according to Bhante Punaji, Satipatthana means to place the attention within. And he goes on to explain that a more precise English translation of Satipatthana would actually be the word introspection, a word that is used in psychology. Now, Satipatthana is about being awake. It's about developing what I call conscious presence or conscious abiding. <laughs> 
So, you know, when someone says they are trying to be mindful, what they're really saying, what they mean is that they are trying to remain conscious and present and awareness. So when one turns the attention in, inwardly, within, what is it that they are turning their attention inwards to? Now, what the practitioner of meditation turns the attention inwards to is called the four foundations of mindfulness. Bhante Punaji calls them the four focuses of introspection or attention. Now, these four focuses of introspection are the body, the feelings or qualities of sensations, the emotions or chitta, and the mano or constructs of the mind. Now, why place the attention on the body, the feelings, and the mind? You place the attention on the body, the feelings, and the mind so that you can become conscious of the reactions of the body, feelings, and mind to emotional disturbances. Now, in the body, we observe if the emotional disturbances have made the body tense or is the body relaxed? You know, what is the posture of the body? What is the heart rate, the breathing rate? Is the body in pain or not in pain? Is the body itching or not itching? Whatever is happening in the body, we are simply to be mindful. Then we observe the feelings. Now, here when we use the word feelings, we are not speaking of emotions. Rather, as stated before, we are speaking of the qualities of our sensual experiences. Do I feel comfortable or uncomfortable? Is there a pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant sensation? And then we observe the chi. What is the emotion being experienced? Is it anger, worry, and anxiety? Is it sexual arousal? Am I distressed or am I calm? And finally, we observe the mano. What thoughts are going through my head? What is presently arising in memory and imagination? What are the present contents of my mind? Or is my mind still? Now, it is key to be consciously alert to these reactions because when we are mindful of them, then we can consciously act to do something to eliminate or change their states if they are inharmonious. If the reaction in the body is such that the breathing rate is increased and the body has become full of tension and the mind distressed, then we can consciously relax the body and calm the mind. Also, emotions and emotionally fueled thoughts are unconscious processes. The emotional disturbances and the inharmonious behaviors that stem from them happen in a state of semi-consciousness, semi-unconsciousness. In other words, before you feel an emotion or disturbing thought, let's say fear, for instance, you know, you don't tell yourself, okay, now I'm going to feel fearful. <laughs> or, or you don't decide, okay, now I'm going to think this thought that brings conflict. <laughs> you know, most of the time we aren't even aware of our behavior until after we have acted. 
Now, these emotions and thoughts arise unconsciously and outside of your awareness. So when we are mindful, when we are conscious, then these habits or hindrances cannot arise. It is like a thief that cannot steal your valuables because you are watching. Now, as mentioned before, Satipatthana is cultivation that is properly prepared for by the monk or dedicated practitioner that renounces the worldly way of living. You know, monks actually did not practice meditation or Satipatthana for only 20 minutes to an hour a day. Satipatthana was actually practiced 24 hours of the day. In fact, some traditions of, 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 of Buddhism, such as the Tibetan tradition, even has a practice known as dream yoga, so that meditation could be practiced during sleep. Now, now that's dedication. So Satipatthana is about being awake, wakefulness. And aspirants would practice constantly being conscious of what they are thinking, what they are speaking, and what are their behaviors. They didn't just allow any thought to be in their mind or allow themselves to just say whatever or to behave unconsciously. Instead, they practice what is called selective thinking, selective speech, and selective behavior. And this could only be accomplished through mindfulness. So really, meditation is the cultivation of happiness. Meditation gets a, a bad rap by a lot of individuals and they say that it's pessimistic, but meditation is really about cultivating happiness. You know, all everybody really wants is to be happy. Now, when we speak about happiness in the teachings of the Buddha, happiness is not sensual pleasure. See, we have to distinguish between sensual pleasure and happiness. Normally, we tend to think of pleasant sensations as happiness and unpleasant sensations as unhappiness. And so what we do is we go in search of pleasures and we try to avoid the pain. And so our whole life is actually an effort to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And as a result, our whole life becomes a life of unhappiness. Because if we really want pleasure only and refuse to accept that in life there will also be pain, what we are really saying is that we are seeking permanent pleasure. And permanent pleasure is impossible because everything in the world is impermanent. So we can never have permanent pleasure. You know, pleasures, they will part from us. And we have to endure pain. This is life. And if we go after pleasures thinking that we are going after happiness, we will never be happy. So this is why the Buddha for the Buddha, the happiness is not a sensation. Happiness is not gained by stimulating the senses, but happiness is a state of mind. But when our minds are emotionally agitated and excited, we can never reach that state of happiness, which is really the state of calmness of mind. And that state of calm is something that is already here, but we lost it. 
when our minds and bodies became agitated by emotional disturbances. <laughs> so meditation is only an effort to return to and maintain our original state of calm. So this is what is meant when it is said that our happiness is inside of us. It is within us. But we are seeking it outside. <laughs> Ain't that something? So this is why the Buddha pointed out that true happiness comes through purification of mind, which is tranquility and stillness of mind peace of mind, a mind free of emotional agitation. So the whole practice of the teaching of the Buddha is an effort to purify the mind. And so now at this point, we come to some actual instruction on how to meditate. It's the good part, it's the good stuff. <laughs> So here we be we will be exploring the practice of the first stage of the actual meditation method. And this practice is what the Buddhists call anapanasati, or what is commonly called breathing meditation. Now, anapanasati is a very simple and easy practice to engage in. And it is a practice that is extremely effective for relaxing the body and calming the mind. And upon society is the method that is used to anchor the awareness to the body. And it actually flows naturally into the practice of Satipatthana. So the practice and upon society, let us begin by finding a nice comfortable place with some nice comfortable clothes on <laughs> quiet place where we can be free of distractions and really give ourselves the best opportunity to take advantage of the benefits of this practice that this practice has to offer now for those of you that are new to this try and set aside a window of time of at least 15 to 20 minutes for this practice. This is until you become more skillful and advanced in this technique, at which point you can do it as long as you choose. <laughs> Next, it is to find a place to sit where you will be able to keep your back straight and your spine aligned. Now, this is very important because we want to avoid letting our backs be hunched over and our shoulders to slouch. It's not good. We need a straight back, a straight spine. Now, there is no need for difficult postures. I know a lot of you see all of the crazy postures. But, you know, a simple chair will do. Or if you are having some problems that makes sitting upright in the chair um, difficult, it's okay to lie down on your back while meditating as long as your back and spine are straight. That's the important thing. So back straight, chin slightly tucked, and eyes closed. Now, once we become more skillful at this, we can do it with our eyes open or closed. And now the key here is to simply and gently breathe in exhaling through the nostrils and breathe out, gently exhaling through the nostrils. Again, repeat, breathe in, gently inhaling through the nostrils and breathe out, exhaling through the nostrils. Now, one thing you will quickly notice when you are new to meditation practice is that the mind is very restless and oftentimes wander from the object of your attention. So every time this happens, just simply take note of it whenever you recognize that this has happened. And without getting 
involved with the mind wandering and let it, it letting it carry your attention away. Just gently bring your attention back to your breathing. And now a side note on this technique. In the Anapanasati Sutta of the Pali Canon, in this description of this technique, the Buddha instructs the practitioner to simply breathe in knowing that you are breathing in and to breathe out knowing that you are breathing out. Now, in my personal experience, I found that as you inhale, breathing in through the nostrils, as you inhale, if I focus my attention on the sensation of the air at the tip of my nose as it passes in and out of the nostrils as I inhale and exhale, that this really helps to calm and settle the mind. And when inhaling and when exhaling, if I allow my abdomen to gently expand on the in-breath and gently and naturally contract on the out-breath, that this really helps the body to relax and release physical stress and tension. Now, again, this is my personal experience with this technique. So I invite you to feel free to explore and experiment with these last two descriptions and discover for yourself what works best for you. But know that the actual instruction itself says that when breathing in, whether long or short, deeply or shallow, simply remember to be mindful that you are doing so. And the same thing goes for the out breath. And that's how you practice in Anapanasati. Very easy, very simple. And the important thing to keep in mind here is to breathe in, relaxing the body, and to breathe out, relaxing the body. And to do so mindfully. Now, the practice of relaxing the body and gradually bringing the mind to stillness is called samatha bhavana and the practice of observing and contemplating the sankaras or the constructs of the mind is called vipassana bhavana which is the focus of the eighth step in the teaching of the sublime eightfold way but we will focus on the eighth step another time as the beginners and intermediate levels of meditation have been discussed. And so this completes the meditation half of the presentation. And next in the second half of the presentation, which will be coming in the near future, we will discuss what are some observations that science has made in connection to meditation and its practice. And with that being said, I digress. Who are you? I'm your problem. Who? You? That's him. That's the beast. Call me Rosie Gold. Call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. What Rosie Gold? Ho, holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Call me Rosie Gold. Call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Rosie Gold. Ho, holy Ho. 
I would never let you see in my holy soul They used to call me blessed Cause I got holy flows The broads think I'm God When I dress up in these holy clothes I got angels in my life Every angle in my life Instead of hating on me Blame it on the Christ I'm just trying to fuck these Like Adam and chill And get black smoke Black hat and a black coat I'm, I'm the, the first black pope On Vatican Hill I, heal. I got that rosy gold I got that holy script if you know your role, hold it, hold, take this dick. If you sold your soul, holy ho, make me rich. They call me holy ho, cause I can make a bitch. I put your soul to sleep just for speaking out your asses. My crew is so elite though, we are not the masses. I got mass on Sunday, ass on Monday. Automatic beat, beat, that's that gunplay. My dog gotta eat, and I know I gotta meet my God one day. You are looking at your God. Call me Rosy Gold, call me Holy Ho. I would never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosy Gold, look what I did. Go in. I would never let you see. I think it's working. Call me Rosy Gold, call me Holy Ho. I would never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosy Gold, Hook, Holy Ho. I would never let you see. Keep it. going in. I have indeed became a wean child of whom my mother spoke. If I die, I shall spring out of another yoke that's at the shot. Spring out. On another note, I leave blocks fiend out. On another dope, are you not entertained? Not, not entertained by the juice that I rock and the rocks in my chain. Go by in. the shoes that I rock and the rocks in my ring. Go Do in. you wear the same clothes? Are you not interchanged? If you fuck the same hoes, you are not in my lane. I do not cop blocks on these little knock knocks. I just pop shots at they little drop tops That's two to the head I'll shoot you in your head I'll make them niggas go to sleep with suits in they bed Y'all niggas not jiggy, yo, those niggas not hot These niggas not biggie, yo, who told them they was pop? Keep going Call me Rosie Gold, call me Holy Ho I would never let you see in my holy soul Look, Rosie Gold, huh, Holy Ho I will never let you see in my holy soul. Call me Rosie Go, call me Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. Look, Rosie Go, ho, Holy Ho. I will never let you see in my holy soul. That's it. I think it's working. That's it. Fade away.